Hello again, I'm Eric Zimmer, and welcome back to the history of the British royal family. Last time, I apologize for the inconvenience, but the camera suddenly shut off when I was finishing up the last paragraph of the last chapter. It was talking about how George I of England didn't have much else to appeal to his subjects, aside from being Protestant. And this is what the last lines had said. They had endured bad kings, mad kings, despots, usurpers, and weaklings. But as the English were soon to discover, the Hanoverians were something else. And yes, indeed, the Hanoverians are something else. And we're about to find out. The Hanoverian in family, this part, was also known as the Georgian error of England, as the next four kings were named George the First, George the Second, George the Third, and George the Fourth, who ruled for 116 years from 1714 to 1830. And you'll be more familiar with some of these kings, as one of them, George the Third, was the one who was talked about in the history of the American Revolution. Are you ready? All right, let's begin. Chapter 12, The Hanoverians, Part 1, Mistresses and Madness, A Feuding Family. All but one of the Hanoverian kings were among the crudest courses monarchs in England ever had. Their manners were dreadful, and they showed little idea of how to behave. In an age when the English expected monarchs to be gracious and dignified, the Hanoverians had no concept of what the words meant. Even worse, King George I started a terrible family tradition. Each Hanoverian monarch clashed violently with his heir. These were not just family spats, they were vicious contests. Real harm was intended, and real harm was done. The English were shocked to find out what George I was like. He was a dull man with reddish features and bulging eyes. He was something of a savage. Boorish and uncultured, he spoke very little English and had only three interests in life. Women, horses, and food. George came to England with two mistresses. Both were incredibly ugly. One was Melissina von Schlulenberg. The other was Charlotte Sophia Kelmans. King George was very fond of both. He lost no chance to show them off at court. This trio soon became a national joke in England. The contrast between the two mistresses was hilarious. Schlulenberg was nearly 60 years old and thin as a reed. She became known as the Maypole. Kelman's was a huge mass of wobbling fat. She was called <laughs> Elephant and Castle after a district in South London. Both were dubbed Ugly Old Trolls. There was even extra spicy gossip about Kelman's. It was widely hinted that she was King George's half-sister. George I was the first divorced King of England since Henry VIII. The tragedy surrounding his divorce fed gossipers with endless tittle-tattle. George's marriage in 1682 had been a disaster from the start. George and his wife, Sophia Dorothea of Selly, had hated each other since they were children. They happened to be first cousins. But their marriage was a business arrangement. Both families gained new lands because of it. Unfortunately, Sophia Dorothea was looking for happiness in her marriage. She found the opposite. George was dour, lumpish, and could not take a joke. Sophia, by contrast, was a bright spark. She was very pretty, lively, and full of fun. George did not understand her, nor did he try. He was often away from Hanover, fighting wars. When at home, he usually preferred to play around with his mistresses. Sophia was too young and impetuous to put up with such a situation. In 1686, while pregnant with her second child, she burst into George's study and demanded he get rid of his mistresses. George was furious. He seized Sophia and shook her violently, almost strangling her. Sophia became hysterical! Fortunately, her second child, a daughter, was safely born in March of 1687. Around this time, a Swedish count by the name of Philip Christoph von Koinsmark arrived at the court of Hanover. 
Coins mark was everything George was not. He was 22 years old, very handsome, and a real charmer. Men liked him. Women adored him. Coins mark, a soldier, had come to Hanover for a job. Instead, he became Sophia Dorothea's lover. The two became attracted to each other at a ball given in Hanover in 1688. Coins mark looked wonderful in a suit of pink and silver. Sophia wore a beautiful white dress and flowers in her hair. It was all very romantic, even magical. Before long, Coins Mark was hopelessly in love with Sophia. He wrote her passionate love letters every day, sometimes twice a day. Sophia kept trying to send him away. She realized taking a lover would be very dangerous. But eventually, he broke down her resistance. Sophia and Coins Mark became lovers sometime in 1691. The gossip gossipers soon got a hold of the story. From there, George's family learned about it. They placed Sophia under constant surveillance. And then on the night of July 1st, 1694, the two lovers met in Sophia's apartments at Liney Place in Hanover. <coughs> <coughs> Coins Mark begged Sophia to run away with him. Apparently, someone had seen him going into the apartment. But no one saw him coming out. In fact, no one ever saw Count Coins Mark again. What had happened to him? People say he was murdered on George's orders and his body was chopped into pieces. The pieces were supposedly placed beneath the floorboards of the royal country house, Heron House. George took a terrible revenge on Sophia. On December 28th, 1694, they were divorced. Sophia was forbidden to see her son and daughter and was shut away for life in the castle of Alton. She remained there for 32 years until her death in 1726. My God. That's pretty harsh. That's very harsh. Sophia Dorothea haunted George for the rest of his life. He was terrified she would escape from Alden. He destroyed all documents concerning their divorce. No one was allowed to speak of Sophia and his presence. George's son and heir, George Augustus, had been only 11 years old when he last saw his mother. But he never forgot her. And he never forgave his father. When he came to England with his wife, Caroline, he kept two portraits of Sophia Dorothea hidden in their apartments. George Augustus became very popular in England. Unlike his father, he spoke English. Caroline was beautiful and gracious. It was no wonder people liked them. Not so with King George. His subjects never liked him. They made fun of him and his mistresses. They wrote rude pamphlets about him. Journals published cartoons that made him look ridiculous. But George Augustus and Caroline did not suffer this way. They were welcomed wherever they went. The king grew jealous of them. When he hit back, he hit hard. Just before Christmas in 1717, he ordered George Augustus and Caroline to leave St. James's Palace in London. Worse! The king ordered them to leave their four young children behind. Unfortunately, the youngest child, a boy, M Prince George William, died soon thereafter. He was only three months old. The autopsy showed he had a faulty heart. Even so, his parents blamed King George. George Augustus and Caroline set up a new home of their own in London. It became a popular meeting place for politicians and those who, uh, and others who disliked King George and his ministers. People said that many plots to overthrow the king were hatched at Leicester House. If there were, nothing actually happened. But the rival royal court only increased the hatred between father and son. The pair never truly reconciled. On occasion, they made a great show of affection in public to convince everyone everything was alright. But it was not. This show was a lot more difficult to sustain after Sophia Dorothea died in Alden on November 2nd, 1726. After the news reached London, King George went to see a play with his mistresses. He showed every sign of enjoying himself. My God. The 18th century was not an age of tender feelings. It was a cruel, crude time. Even so, the audience was shocked. They did not expect to see their monarch behave like such a cad. King George and Sophia Dorothea seemed linked in a, had seemed linked in a curious way. 
George came to hear of a prophecy about them. When one died, so said the prophecy, the other's death would follow within a year. In June of 1727, King George went back to his elector, Hanover, for a visit. Some said that a letter supposedly written by Sophia Dorothea was thrown into his coach. It reminded him of the prophecy. The letter was right. <coughs> Excuse me. On the way to Hanover, the king suffered a stroke. His entourage managed to reach Osnabrück safely on June 11th. But that same night, King George died. The news took four days to reach England. Prime Minister Robert Walpole rode all the way from London to Richmond, Surrey to inform George Augustus, now King George II. The new king received the news without emotion. Fun fact, as George I died in his native Hanover, he is the last British monarch to be buried outside of the United Kingdom. All other substant kings and queens have been buried, of course, in the United Kingdom. Just a little fun fact for you. But anyways. <clears throat> George II's first act was to order portraits of his mother, Sophia Dorothea, brought from their hiding place. The portraits were to be hung where all could see. The new king seemed like a welcome change from his father. He was much friendlier and much more gracious. But that was just a show. In fact, King George hated England the English, and everything about them. I wish with all my heart that the devil take your Prime Minister, he once exploded in a rage, and the devil take the Parliament, and the devil take the whole island, provided I can get out of it and go to Hanover. <coughs> Hanover was, of course, his sanctuary. There he could be free from that damned House of Commons. Hanover would allow him to rule as an absolute monarch by divine right. George's wife, Queen Caroline, was a great asset to her husband. She was beautiful, charming, and clever. George adored Caroline. Even in public, he could hardly keep his hands off her. Caroline could easily have dominated him, but George would not have it. He wanted everyone to see he was boss. But everyone knew otherwise. The truth was that Caroline, together with Prime Minister Robert Walpole, had the king on a string. The two used to discuss the latest political questions in private and together would decide what the government's policy was to be. Then Walpole would arrive at the palace to see King George. Queen Caroline would be in the room, stitching quietly at her embroidery. While Caroline remained in the background, the two men talked. <clears throat> but the Queen and Walpole prearranged a set of secret hand signals. During his conversation with the King, Walpole played with his hat, or he took snuff. Or he pulled out his handkerchief. Caroline sent a signal back by raising her fan or threading a needle. George never noticed a thing. Once he and Walpole had agreed about policy, he imagined it was all his own idea. <laughs> <clears throat> but there was something George and Caroline did agree about. Both detested their eldest son, Prince Frederick. They began to dislike him almost as soon as he arrived in England from Hanover in 1728. The trouble was, Frederick was not the heir to the throne his parents wanted. He was not the military type. He preferred writing poetry to fighting wars and was a talented musician. As far as King George was concerned, Frederick was a weakling. He far preferred his second son, William, Duke of Cumberland. William was a soldier first and last. He was also very uncuff. He gained a terrible reputation for cruelty in the Second Jacobite Rebellion in 1745. Then the Stuart who tried to reclaim the English throne was Charles Edward Stuart, son of James Edward Stuart. Charles was known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. The rebellion came to a shocking end at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Highlanders who supported Charles were slaughtered by the hundreds mainly by lowland Scot soldiers. Later, there were executions and massacres. Scottish homes were looted and burned. Whole communities were destroyed. Bonnie Prince Charlie managed to escape back to Europe, aided by one Flora MacDonald. She disguised him as a woman, Betty Burke, an Irish spinning maid. Once it was all over, Scots dubbed William Butcher Cumberland for his cruelty. Frederick presumably would not have acted like his brother. He was too kind-hearted. 
When Flora MacDonald was taken to London and locked up in the Tower of London, Frederick visited her and offered help. Because of Frederick, Flora was set free. That, of course, did not please the king one bit. Here was his hated heir actually helping his Scottish enemies. Soon history began to repeat itself. King George and Frederick had vicious quarrels. Frederick was banned from his father's court and the royal palaces. A rival court gathered around Frederick and his wife, Princess Augusta. When told of it, King George flew into one of his violent rages. He is a monster and the greatest villain ever born, he ranted. My firstborn is the greatest ass and the greatest liar and the greatest beast in the whole world, and I most heartily wish he was out of it. Tragically, Frederick soon fulfilled his father's wishes. Quite suddenly, in 1751, Frederick became seriously ill. While he was working in his garden one day, it began to rain and Frederick was soaked to the skin. Before long, he was suffering from pleurisy. Pleurisy turned to pneumonia, and then on the night of March 20th, 1751, he suddenly clutched his chest and cried out, I feel death! <coughs> <coughs> Minutes later, Frederick was dead. He was only 44 years old. An anonymous poet had the last word about Frederick and the Hanoverian family. <coughs> Here lies Fred, who was alive and is dead. Had it been his father, I had much rather, had it been his brother, still better than another, had it been his sister, no one would have missed her. Had it been the whole generation, still better for the nation. But it was Fred who was alive and is dead. There is nothing more to be said. King George was playing cards when told his son was dead. He continued his game. He was glad Frederick was gone. And the son was not given a proper funeral for an heir to the throne. Suspicion was that King George adored it that way. No member of the royal family attended. Nor did any English lord or bishop. There was only a brief ceremony without music. Frederick's successor as heir to the throne was his eldest son, 13-year-old Prince George, the future King George III. George William Frederick was forced to live with his grandfather at Hampton Court Palace. He was a stubborn boy. The king often complained that his grandson lacked the desire to please. In other words, he would not do as he was told. George frequently had his ears boxed for disobedience. Although young, Prince George had learned much from watching his father and grandfather. Though both were devoted to their wives, they were also great womanizers. Young George vowed that when he became king, he would clean up the royal act. There would be no mistresses, immorality at court, gambling, or extravagance. George III set the pace himself. He was still unmarried when he became king at the age of 22 in 1760 but he immediately gave up his teenage love, Lady Sarah Lennox. Although Sarah was aristocratic, her brother was Duke of Richmond, her rank was not high enough to become queen. Giving up Sarah caused George a great deal of pain, but he was also mindful of the dignity of the British crown. So the woman he married in 1761 was much more highly ranked, Princess Charlotte of mecklenburg sterlitz King George was totally faithful to her for the 57 years their marriage lasted. <clears throat> George and Charlotte had 15 children, nine sons and six daughters. But if George thought he was going to bring back good old-fashioned family values with his many offspring, he was sadly mistaken. The king kept his daughters at home, ostensibly to save them from the so-called wicked world, but his sons were a disgrace. One of them, William, Duke of Clarence, the future King William IV, seduced two of the queen's maids of honor when he was only thirteen. <laughs> Later, he had ten illegitimate children by his mistress, the married actress Dorothea Jordan. Another son, Ernest, Duke of Cumberland, had a child by his own sister, Princess Sophie. My God. <clears throat> the youngest son, Edward, Duke of Kent, the father of Queen Victoria, lived for 28 years with his French mistress, Madame Laurent. Two other sons were eccentric and badly behaved, frequently making nuisances of themselves in the House of Lords. 
On one occasion, they had to be removed, swearing and making rude gestures. Undoubtedly, the worst of the sons was the eldest. George Augustus Frederick, Prince of Wales, the future King George the Fourth. No vice seemed beyond him. He was vain, arrogant, and inconsiderate. He bedded a long series of unsuitable mistresses, including other men's wives. Ho, 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 ho. He was already an experienced hand at gambling, drinking, and creating scandal by the age of 17. As if this were not enough, the Prince of Wales was also wildly extravagant. Spend, spend, spend might have been his motto. In 1787, he was in the red to the tune of 220,000 pounds. <laughs> this was not merely a personal problem. It was a matter of royal prestige. It did not look good to have tradesmen and other creditors pounding on the door of the heir to the throne demanding payment, or just as bad refusing him credit. King George III did not have sufficient funds to pay his son's debts, so Parliament had to bail out the prince and pay his bills. But the prince was not cured. Far from it. He kept right on spending, fancying himself as something of a dandy and expending vast sums on clothes. The prince was also fond of building projects, jewels, expensive parties, and expensive women. <clears throat> and then in 1784, Prince George committed the greatest of all his follies. He fell madly in love with Mrs. Maria Fitzherbert, a twice-widowed commoner, six years his senior. Senior means, like, older than. Junior means younger than, just so you know. He asked her to become his mistress, but she was a devout Roman Catholic and a respectable woman. She refused. It was marriage or nothing. And so George and Maria were married in 1785. In secret, the parson who performed the ceremony was released from debtor's prison for the specific purpose. With this marriage, George had broken two very important laws in England. One was the Act of Settlement of 1701, which stated that no one in the line of succession to the throne could marry a Roman Catholic. If they do, then they're excluded from the line. It has happened with some descendants of King George V. The other was the Royal Marriage Act of 1772, which banned royals from marrying before the age of 25 without the monarch's permission. And that explains why it was said that Prince William had to be 25 before he could ask Queen Elizabeth II to be married. Hmm. George was 23 when he married Maria. This did not stop him from living openly with his wife. From time to time he found a new mistress and wandered off. But he always returned to Maria. He called her the wife of my heart and soul. Maria was undoubtedly good for the prince. She civilized him. She made him cut down on his drinking. She put a stop to some of his more boorish habits. Such as picking his teeth in public. Ugh. And then in 1788, King George became very s the third became very sick. No one knew what was wrong. He had to endure many months of bizarre and painful quackery before he recovered fully. This may have been the inspiration for the 1994 movie with Nigel Hawthorne, The Madness of King George. Hmm. <clears throat> By 1794, the Prince of Wales was in big trouble again. He built up another huge mountain of debts. He became bankrupt, owing 630,000 pounds. I wonder how much that is in today's money. Once again, he had to ask Parliament to pay. Parliament agreed, but with strings attached. Thanks to his sons and their mistresses, King George III now had an army of illegitimate grandchildren. What he did not have was a single legitimate grandchild to continue the Hanoverian dynasty, and I assume that, considering the Prince of Wales was the eldest, Parliament wanted him to set a good example to his younger brothers, but that's just my guess. But anyways, <clears throat> Parliament offered the Prince of Wales a deal. His debts would be paid, but he had to marry legally and produce legitimate heirs to the throne. The Prince was trapped! He had to agree, and Mrs. Fitzherbert therefore had to go. Instead, he would marry the wife his father now chose for him. Princess Caroline of Brunswick was the king's niece and the prince's first cousin. But she was the worst possible choice the king could have made. Her family background said it all. Her fa she came from an unhappy home. 
Her parents were constantly at war with each other. Two of her brothers were mentally retarded. Caroline had grown up thoroughly spoiled. Her conversation was peppered with swear words. She was vain, rebellious, and immoral. It was as if King George was allowing his son to marry a wild beast. Prince George knew nothing about any of this. In fact, he and Caroline had never met before she arrived in England for their wedding. But when he saw her for the first time, he went into shock. Harris, he gasped to his attendant, Lord Malmesbury, I am not well. Pray get me a glass of brandy. But the shock the prince received at Greenwich was nothing compared to what followed. He did not know it yet, but the stage was set for the most outrageous royal scandal England had ever known. Which we will find out next time. Thank you. Have a good night.